Welcome to my six part tutorial series teaching you how to make a platformer in Game Maker. I'm Dr. Sky Laurel Anderson at the University of St. Thomas. And thus far, we have a game with all the movement and jumping mechanics. Mechanics, we have sounds, we have combat, we have a game over system, we have a door uh, and transition system with fade ins and fade outs. Uh, basically, the mechanics of our game are finished. So now what we need to do is create a title screen, a save and load system, and we're also gonna add some visual effects to make the game seem a little less sterile and a little bit more interesting and vibrant. So let's get started. We have a lot to get through today, so I'm gonna to try to go fast so it doesn't turn into a 90 minute video. So let's get going. The first thing you need to do is we are going to rename our splash to our title. Now in my own games, I always have a room called R splash that runs before everything else that deals with global variables. But uh, in this game, it's going to be okay because I've designed it so global variables never get called uh, until they are declared appropriately in our title. So I'm going to click R splash. I'm going to rename it to R title, and it's going to be our title room. We are going to go to the initialize script. Hold on, uh, fix my notes. We're gonna to go to the initialize script and we're gonna remove the room, room go to function because we're gonna have a button that's gonna do that. And then we are also gonna to go to our title creation code and add a fade in here, which you won't be able to see because our fade in is black and currently the room is also black. So we'll check that later. Also in our title, we're going to add a new instance layer called player, because as you recall, our fade in and fade out script uh, uses the player layer. So we just got to make sure in every single room in our game has a layer called player. So let's add a title. We're going to go to sprites, create sprite, call it S, uh, what am I calling it? S title, import the appropriate image title.png. There we go. And I'm gonna set the origin to be middle center. It doesn't really matter because we're not gonna assign this to an object. We're just gonna use it as a sprite. We're gonna open our title and we're gonna create a new assets layer over here, new asset layer with a little plus sign. And this allows us to add sprites directly into our room without them needing to be an object that runs code. So we can just click that asset layer. I'm gonna rename this asset layer to uh, I don't know, assets. And then we, with this highlighted, we can just drag S tile directly, oh, S title directly into the room uh, and put it in here. I think in my game, I have it like over here. Yeah, we can always adjust it. Now let's add some buttons. Uh, so from this title screen, players are gonna be able to click a button to start the game a button to uh, delete a previously saved game or to go to a settings menu. Create a new sprite, sprite and call it S uh, button. Change its canvas size to be 200 by 70 pixels. Apply. Fill it with any color. I'm going to fill it with just yellow. Oh, that's kind of bright. Dark, dark green. <laughs> How about that? Actually, you know, for our game, let's keep it visually consistent. There we go. Uh, and set the sprite origin to be middle center because that we're going to run some code that's going to re rely on its origin to be middle center. Now create a new object called O. Uh, button start. O, capital B button, capital S start, and assign the button sprite there. Now, before we do anything else, we're going to open our title room and drag O button start in there so we don't forget. Oh, I need to make sure I have the proper layer selected. I'm going to do the instances layer. I'm going to put it like right. I don't like that. I'm going to change the grid. Be 16 by 16. 
There we go. Because we're going to be running some code on it very quickly, I just want to make sure it's in the room. Now, O button start object, add a create event, and write hover equals false. It's a Boolean called hover. It's going to tell the game whether the mouse is hovering over it or not. Go to add event, step event, and write if distance to point mouse x mouse y is less than or equal to zero, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. What this checks to see if the distance in pixels from the mouse to the object, the bounding box or the border of the object is at zero, meaning it's hovering or less than zero, meaning it's hovering. Uh, we set hover to true. Else, hover equals false. There we go. Now we have a system to always know whether our mouse is hovering over the button or not. Now add a draw event. Now, normally, if we want to make sure the sprite doesn't get overwritten, we write draw self. But here, we actually want the sprite to get overwritten. We do not want to see this uh, bright fuchsia box anymore. Uh, so we're not going to write draw self, and we're just going to create the button from scratch. So new comment, find rectangle coordinates, because to draw a rectangle, we need the coordinates of the top left corner and the bottom right corner. So x1, y1, uh, x2, y2. So let's do that, var. And with all local variables, I do an underscore var x1 equals x minus sprite x open parentheses, sprite width, divided by two, close parentheses. When dealing with arithmetic or math, always use parentheses. Do not rely on order of operations. Var x2 equals x plus sprite width, divided by two. Similarly, var y1 equals y minus sprite height, divided by two. Var y2 equals y plus sprite height divided by two. And now you understand why we actually have a sprite that we're not going to use is because we're using the sprite just to create the size of the rectangle for our button. And that way we can, if we don't like the size of our button, we can change the size of our sprite and it will automatically update what the rectangle coordinates should be. New comment, button text, draw set h align, faw center, Draw set V align, faw middle. Draw set font, F default. And now we're going to uh, add an if condition that uses this hover boolean here. If bang hover, so if hover is false, else if hover is true. So if hover is false, draw set color C purple, draw rectangle, and use those local variables we just created, x1, y1, x2, y2, false, because we want it to be filled in, not an outline, and then draw set color C fuchsia, is going to be the color of our text. We set the color of our rectangle and we draw the rectangle and then we change the color for the text that will follow. And then when we're not, then when we are hovering over it, we need some a different color. So draw set color C fuchsia. Draw rectangle. And I'm just going to just actually copy and paste this. And then draw set color C underscore aqua. So when we're hovering over it, our text will be aqua and our rectangle will be fuchsia. When we're not hovering over it, uh, text will be fuchsia and the rectangle will be purple. And then we draw text X, Y, which is like the middle of the rectangle, which is where we set the origin. 
the text, I'm just going to say begin. Or we could do something like maybe not begin. That's how I do it. I have it in the example game. Let's put play instead. And let's test it out. It's already in our room. Let's see if we have any bugs. We don't. So the colors change when I hover over it. Very nice. Beautiful. Uh, also for our our title, I want the background to be the same as everywhere else. So our background color, I'm going to go here and just copy the hex code here. Okay. Title, background, hex code. I'll paste that there. There we go. Same purple color. There we go. It's still very dark. It's very like near black, but it's not black. It's appropriate for our game. Okay, now we're going to make it so we can click the button and it'll start the game. So this is really simple. Open O button, start step event. Uh, in this distance to point condition where it says true, we're just going to add another condition. If mouse check button pressed, meaning if we click a mouse button and which mouse button is going to look at, we can do MB left, MB right. We can do say the mouse button. I like to just do MB underscore any, meaning any mouse button. If any mouse button gets pressed, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, fade out, global dot. So right here tells us we need to add a room and a target X and a target Y. So the room will be global dot checkpoint room, global dot checkpoint X, global dot checkpoint Y. Close parentheses, semicolon. And now it should work. So let's try it. So if I hover over it and then click, it fades out, it takes us to our level one. Nice. Let's add a sound effect to indicate when the button is being hovered over or not. We're going to make two sounds, a hover sound and a button click sound. So go over sounds, create sound. Let's call this one SND button hover. And let's load up our sounds. Where is our hover? There we go, SND button hover. Duplicate that and call this SND button click. Load up SND button click. Now go back to O button start in the step event. Uh, in this distance to point condition, right before it sets hover to true, we are going to write if hover is false, meaning if if bang hover or if hover is false. Audio, play, sound, SMD, button, hover, one, false. So we first put our mouse button over it and it checks, hey, is hover still false? If it is, play the sound and then immediately set hover to true. So it'll only play the sound for one frame, which is kind of nice. And now for clicking, uh, since we're using the, fu the function mouse check button pressed, instead of mouse check button pressed, only uh, is a function that returns true only one frame, the most recent frame that that button was pressed. We don't need to add any special conditions. We can we can just write audio, play sound, SND button, click, one, false. Let's test it out. Loading up right now. Oh, failed to convert, SND button hover. Let's load it up again. Try it again. There we go. This sometimes happens when you duplicate sounds. So we have our hover sound and our click sound. Beautiful. Uh, now to make sure we can't keep clicking the button after we click it once. So right now, if I do this, I can sort of keep clicking it. It doesn't do anything, but it shouldn't feel or look or act that way. Uh, we're going to go to the step event and wrap the entire contents of the step event in the following condition. So this is going to be the condition. If bang instance exists 
O fade, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket. I'm going to add a closed curly bracket at the very end, and then highlight all of this and hit tab or indent. So that way, if fade exists, we cannot keep clicking on it. So I was spamming the mouse button. You can probably hear it in my microphone. And it only responded once. Now to make it look a little bit more polished, we're going to create a new tile layer in the room, our title. Uh, tile layer, call this tiles. And we're going to do what we did in our other room. We're going to select a tile set, go to libraries, select auto tile. And I'm just going to just add tiles all the way around. Yeah, I might need to move my logo. There we go. I might need to move my button slightly. Let's put it there. I think that's enough room. Run the game. Give it some visual polish. Nice. And in our room code script, we're going to make it so we no longer see the mouse after we click into our level one. So we're going to go to room code and we're going to add Comment make mouse cursor disappear. We're going to write window that cursor cr underscore none, semicolon. However, when we're in the title screen, we want to definitely see our cursor. So uh, in the initialize script, we're going to add window that cursor cr underscore default. and check to see if it works. Our mouse should disappear when we get to our level one. But when we're in our title, we see the mouse. Now we need a save and loan system and a, sa and a, a delete save button. Uh, so first let's write some scripts. We need a save game script and a load game script. So create a new script, call this save game and write all of this. There's going to be a lot of writing. So here we go. If file exists, open quote, RSG save. Now I'm calling it RSG save because the name of my game is Rose Smashed Glasses. And this is a save file. So RSG save dot save. Close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. File delete RSG save.sav. Now, if it exists, it'll delete it. If it doesn't exist, it just ignores that. But now we get to create this file and we create it by using the function INI underscore open. So INI is a type of text file, an any or an INI that uh, is a text file that has uh, categories to organize itself, which is great for save files. And by doing INI open, it creates a new file on the player's computer, whether you're playing on Mac or Windows, or if you're playing in a web browser, it will create this text file on their computer that will be a save file. We're going to call it RSG save dot sap. Semicolon and INI write real progress comma, this is the name of the category, room, comma, global dot checkpoint, room. I and I write real progress, x, global dot checkpoint, x. I and I write real progress what oh open quote mark y global dot checkpoint y i and i close so this will create a little save file with the room x and y it's kind of nice 
Now you're gonna see like maybe little red squigglies here. Don't worry about that. This will save appropriately. Now for the load game script, create a new script, call it load game and write if file exists, rsg save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. If it exists, I and I open rsg save. Dot, oh, I have a typo here. I said rsg save. Dot save. It needs to be rsg save. Dot sav. There we go. I need. I and I open rsg save .sav, open that file up if it exists. Now, if it already exists, it's not going to create a new file. It just opens it up. And then we are going to read values stored in that uh, text file and assign them to global variables. So global.checkpointroom equals I and I read real. From the progress section, the value for room and we write a default value in case it doesn't find this information in the text uh, file. So what I do here is I just write the values that are already declared in the initialize script, which is r level one. Global.checkpointx equals ini read real progress x and then whatever we have for our initialize script. What do I have for x and y? 256. And then here, I'm going to just copy and paste this to make it go a little faster and just change it global.checkpoint y, progress y, and then value. There we go. And then ini underscore close. All right, so everything should work with our save and load script. So now we just need to put our save game script somewhere where it makes sense. And I think it makes sense to add it to our checkpoints. So let's go to objects, checkpoint, step, right where it assigns everything here, we can write save game. And then in our death script, death, before the fade out is called here, we can write if file exists, rsg save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, load game, open and close parentheses, semicolon. So if a save file exists when our player touches an enemy or a hazard, it will load up those values before it fades out to those values. Let's try it. Hit play. So right now, if you touch a hazard, it just restarts the room here. Have a checkpoint. Okay, everything is working fine. And we are going to go to the R title creation code room, R title creation code. We're going to add this after the initialized script because remember the initialized script declares the variables. And now we will write if file exists, rsg save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, load game. So after those global variables get set to their default values, the game checks the player's computer to see if it has a save file. If it does, it loads up those saved values into those specific global variables, and then it fades in. So let's test it out. I should hit play, and I should go to the checkpoint. There we go. Loads us up at the checkpoint. Now we need to make a button to delete the uh, delete the save for when we want to start a new game. We just need to add a button to the start menu. So go to o button start and duplicate it and call it o button delete save. Open our title, instances layer, assets, o button delete save. We're going to put it underneath 
our start button. Now open up O button delete save to the draw event where it says begin or where it says play. We're going to change it to clear save data. And in the step event, we're going to delete. Uh, hold on, hold on. Did I miss something here? We didn't. In this, uh, let me change my. Uh, there we go. We're going to remove the fade out script. There we go. And add. Okay, we're going to remove this fade out script because we're delete save. We don't need to fade out anywhere. <laughs> But instead, we're going to write if file exists, rsg save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, file delete, rsg save.sav. And then after that, we will run our initialize script to reset all the values, and then instance destroy to delete the button, because after uh, the save file is deleted, we can just destroy it. No need to have it anymore. So it reinitializes the game and deletes the save file. And also in its create event here, we can also write if bang file exists. So if the file doesn't exist, rsg save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, Ah, instance destroy. So if this file doesn't exist on the player's computer, right when the button gets created, we destroy it. So we won't see it on the title screen. So let's test it out. So right now there is a uh, save file on my computer. So if I click this, it removes itself. And also if I rerun the game, it should just not appear because it checks in the create its creation code if this file doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, it just destroys itself. There we go. Now you notice a problem really quick here where it... Let me get a save file really quick. That the text was too big for the button. Here it says clear save data and it's too big for the button. So let's change that text or we change the size of our font. I don't know what I want to do. Let's just change our text slightly. Clear. Let's do this. Forward slash N. Clear save data. Very good. And then in the future, if we need to make our font smaller, just a little bit smaller, that's totally fine too. Well, now we need to give the player a way to navigate back to the main menu when they're playing the game. And we're going to do this by adding a key input. So open O player in the input section. And let's create a new temporary variable var underscore key return equals keyboard check pressed vk escape the escape key and then be sure to go down here and do the same here underscore key return equals zero now minimize these regions and Where it says remove before publishing. Let's change this section and call it game control. And I'll delete this before publishing, but for now I'm going to add comment back to title menu if underscore key return. If it's true, fade out our title for target X and target Y, just put zero and zero. That might colon. Let's run the game, see if it works. We play. I hit the escape key, fades out, takes us to the title screen, and our mouse appears once again. We have a way to navigate back to the title menu. All right, so this is a title screen, and one thing this title screen is missing, in my opinion, 
is some credits. So let's add some credits to the title screen. We're going to create a new object called O Credits. Let people know who made the game. Add a draw event. And in that draw event, write draw set H align FA center. Draw set V align FA middle. Draw set font F default. Draw set color B underscore fuchsia. Draw text X, Y, open quote, a game concept by forward slash N, Sky Laurel Anderson forward slash N, Sky Laurel dot net. Close quote, close parentheses, semicolon. Let's add it to our title room. So open our title, instances layer, click assets, and find O credits and drag it in to the game. That looks pretty good. I want it a little lower, a little more to the right. Yeah, that looks good. I'm just going to adjust a couple of things here. I'm going to move the assets, change the grid for the assets to be eight by eight. So I have some really fine tuning. I'm going to move this up higher just so our buttons have a little bit more breathing room. See how it looks. Yeah, that looks good. Now let's add some final visual polish to the game by adding two visual effects. One that, that comes with Game Maker called Glow, and we'll add another that we create ourselves. So in all of your rooms, we're going to add an effects layer and assign Glow to it. So let's start with our title. Here you'll see Create New Filter Effect Layer. And we want it at the very top because it'll affect everything underneath it. It's called, it defaults to effect one, but I'm going to rename it to glow and effect type. I'm going to assign glow. If you scroll down, you will see glow. And it says in game only because you're only going to be able to, you can't see a preview of it. With these other effects, you can sort of see a preview of what it'll look like in the game, but glow, you can only see it in the game. So click glow and change the values to the following radius, set it to 32. Quality, set it to 3. Intensity, set it to 0 0.3. Now we want to do the same in other rooms, but just so you can see what it looks like, if I run the game, it gives us a nice soft glow effect. Do the same in the other rooms. Our level 1, new effect layer, call it glow. Effect type, glow, 32, 3. 0 0.3. R level 2. Effect layer, rename it to glow. Effect type, glow 32, 3, 0.3. So we see it. We see the glow effect in our game, a sort of soft, nice little glow. Now the second effect is going to be a scan line effect on the screen to give us sort of a digital cyberpunk look. So we need to for that we need to create a new sprite. Sprite called I'm going to call it uh, S screen filter. Set the canvas to be something really small. For us it needs to be one pixel wide, four pixels high. Click apply, and then edit image. I'm going to zoom in here. And we're going to paint the top two pixels at a black set to an alpha of 110. Click OK. So the top two pixels will be that. And the bottom two pixels will be blank. Exit out of that. Yeah, the origin will be top left center. You don't, it doesn't matter if you change the FPS, but we'll change it to zero anyway. Now we'll create a new object, object called O screen filter. And in its create event, we need to set some values. New comment, 
surfaces are the same are the same size as the display surf underscore filter equals surface underscore create open parentheses room underscore width comma room underscore height So right now this creates a surface the size of our room. However, our rooms are quite big and we don't need a surface that big. We can go back and change that later to the size of our GUI, but we can do that later. But now we're just creating a surface. A surface is a visual thing of like a, it's like a sprite, but it's the static visual thing that a game can add, game maker can add to your game. New comment, setup, uh, filter surface, surface underscore set underscore target, surf underscore filter. So it's that surface that we just created. Draw, write, tiled, S screen filter, sub image of zero, X of zero, Y of zero, surface reset, target. So this creates a surface and then in that surface it draws that filter tiled the entire width and height uh, width and height of that surface. Uh, if you want to learn more about surfaces just uh, scroll wheel click any of these things and read about it in the game maker manual and then we will go to draw GUI because it's going to be just drawing it to the display and we will write screen filter overlay as a comment and then if surface exists surf filter close parentheses close parentheses open curly bracket close curly bracket add a comment if it exists draw it else open curly bracket close curly bracket new comment if it doesn't exist Create it. So for drawing it, it's very simple. You just write draw surface surf filter comma x and y of zero and zero, which is the top left corner of uh, the GUI screen. Else, and now we need to create that surface surf filter equals surface create room room width on my room height surface set target surf filter draw sprite tiled s screen filter zero 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 surface reset target draw surface surf filter zero comma zero comma zero Whew, so we created the screen filter object now we need to add it in our game to actually see it so go to the uh, r title creation code and add instance create layer just put it at coordinates zero and zero. The layer will be the player layer because that exists in every room. Doesn't matter which layer it gets created in, but this is consistent. O screen filter. And that's on the title screen. We should be able to check it out now. So now we have a little scan line effect. We also need it in our rooms, which is very easy to do. I'm just gonna open up that creation code again and just copy this and go to our room code script and add it in the room code script. There we go. And now we get the, the glow and the little scan line effect. 
affects how the game looks. All right, to make this a little bit uh, more reasonable in terms of programming, we actually don't need the uh, the filter to affect the entire size of our rooms because our rooms are quite big. We only need it to affect the size of our camera. So instead of doing room width and room height here, we can just change one small thing here, which is just set it to the width and height of our game screen, which is very easy to do. You just create a local variable. I'm going to call this var double, uh, underscore w for width, and I will use the function display get GUI width, and then var underscore h equals display get GUI height, and then replace room width with underscore w, room height with underscore h. And you can just take this, copy it, go over here, replace it with that. Indent, indent, make sure these load up as local variables. So when we run the game, it should look exactly the same, but now it is not creating a surface the size of our room. It's only creating a surface the size of the display, which, you know, it doesn't matter that much because uh, uh, services are very good at not using a lot of processing power, but, you know, just to be good programmers, this is what we should do. Anyway, that is it uh, for our next video. We are going to be adding a settings menu with just general access accessibility settings. We're going to be able to change difficulty. We're going to be able to add button remapping and also to toggle these visual effects that we just added on and off. So I will see you there.